when to eternity, and we've got the freeze frame behind us here, a film for the future by a Danish filmmaker named Madsen. It's about the proposal in Finland by the nuclear power industry there to open the world's first repository, the first permanent dump site for high-level radioactive waste anywhere in the world. And it's an excellent film, very artfully done, and it raises a whole lot of questions about this proposal. And in fact, it only interviews the proponents of the dump site. It does not interview anti-nuclear activists in Finland who have for years been opposing this plan. So it's very fascinating. And the reason that uh, Beyond Nuclear is working with environmental colleagues here in Michigan on this uh, tour to screen the film and also to speak afterwards and discuss the issues, answer questions, is that the Canadian government is pointing to this Finnish uh, repository proposal as a model to follow right on the shoreline of the Great Lakes, specifically at the Bruce Nuclear Complex, which is just 50 miles across Lake Huron from Michigan. It's, it happens to be uh, the largest operating nuclear power plant in the world right now because the Japanese uh, competition is all shut down, almost all shut down, after Fukushima. But the on only other nuclear plant in the world bigger than Bruce is shut down right now at Kajiwazaki, Kariwa in, in Japan. So unfortunately, uh, for the past decade, the Canadian government has been proposing what they call a deep geologic repository, what we call a deep underground dump, or DUD, for the low and intermediate level radioactive wastes of Ontario. There are 20 reactors in Ontario. That's more than any U.S. state. In the U.S., the, the most reactors in any state was in Illinois at 14 at one time. That's now down to 11. So Ontario is a very nuclearized province. They have a lot of radioactive waste. And the proposed uh, deep underground dump at Bruce would be just a half mile from the water of Lake Huron. So it's really on its face a really insane idea. They talk a good line about how safe it's going to be, about how great the geology is, all of that. But I think what it comes right down to is that the Great Lakes is the drinking water supply for 40 million people, four zero, 40 million people in the U.S. and Canada and a large number of Native American First Nations on both sides of the white man's border. So uh, there's a lot at stake. And in addition to this so-called low and intermediate level radioactive waste dump, just in the past several months, a number of communities near Bruce that are largely populated by Bruce nuclear workers, actually, centered around the town of Kincardine, which is the host of Kincardine, which is the host of the Bruce nuclear complex, have also volunteered for a high-level radioactive waste dump for all of Canada's high-level radioactive waste, and that's the 20 reactors in Ontario and just two more commercial reactors in the whole country, one in New Brunswick, one in Quebec. So as we long feared, what they assured us would only be a so-called low and intermediate level waste dump looks like it's morphing before our very eyes into a national Canadian radioactive waste dump for all categories of waste, low, intermediate, and high. So we're doing our best to get the word out in Michigan. We need to stop this thing. This film subtitle is a film for the future. And our message is that we need to protect future generations as well as present generations in Michigan and throughout the Great Lakes from this very real threat that the Canadian government, the Canadian nuclear industry, unfortunately, is very determined to uh, push forward. One of the first uh, presentations on nuclear power and radioactive waste that I ever attended uh, featured Michael Keegan with Coalition for Nuclear Free Great Lakes. And the first thing he said, and this was nearly 20 years ago, was electricity is but the fleeting byproduct from nuclear power. The actual product is forever deadly radioactive waste. That's a very powerful statement, and it's very true. So this film is entitled Into Eternity, Apparently, under Finnish regulations, they, they worry about it out, out to 100,000 years. But actually, in the United States, under court order, we filed a lawsuit, an environmental coalition, against the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the Yucca Mountain proceeding. That was a proposed deep geologic repository, permanent burial site for all of 
the United States high-level radioactive waste, or at least all that we have right now. We're making more all the time, unfortunately. And we forced the EPA under court order to admit that there's actually a million years of hazard with high-level radioactive waste. So EPA now admits that, acknowledges it. It's not comprehensive. It's still an understatement. So just one example, there's a radioactive poison called iodine-129 with a 15.7 million year half-life. And you have to multiply the half-life times 10 or 20 to get the hazardous persistence. So that's 157 million years or 314 million years of hazard associated with one radioactive poison. There are hundreds in high-level radioactive waste, different isotopes, many of them biologically interactive. So it is very Orwellian to call nuclear power uh, clean. And that applies to every stage, every step of the, of the uranium fuel chain, from initial mining of uranium, uh, milling, processing, enrichment, uh, fabrication of fuel, uh, splitting of atoms, uh, irradiation of the fuel in a reactor core. Even atomic reactors have permits to discharge radioactivity and toxic chemicals on a regular basis into the air, into the water. And then you have the high-level radioactive waste, which refers to the fuel rods when they come out of a reactor. There are a million times more radioactive when they come out than when they went in. In fact, deadly so. Uh, you need radiation shielding at all times on high-level radioactive waste. Otherwise, being in close proximity to it, let's say a yard away, you could get a fatal dose of gamma radiation in seconds or minutes, depending on how long it's been out of the reactor core. But in addition to that high gamma dose that will last for a thousand years, you have, as we said just now, um, a million years or more of long-lasting radioactivity. Uh, plutonium-239 has a 24,000-year half-life. That's 240,000 to 480,000 years of hazard. But then you have other isotopes that are much longer lasting than that. So those have to be isolated from the living environment forevermore. That's the title of a famous book from the late 80s about radioactive waste in the United States. Forevermore, radioactive waste in America. Well, the engineers behind these uh, proposals will talk very confidently about how long the burial containers will, will last into the future. But it was interesting at Yucca Mountain in Nevada, the regulations were going to be cut off at 10,000 years into the future. And that's what we forced them to abandon in court. The court ordered the Environmental Protection Agency to uh, look at the long-term hazard. And so now EPA is looking at a million years of hazard at Yucca Mountain. They cannot cut off regulations at 10,000 years. It's very telling that they chose 10,000 years because the Department of Energy, which is the proponent in this country for that dump site, or was previously, was predicting that the first container failures would occur at about 11,000 years. So they could talk very confidently about the longevity of their containers as long as they didn't have to go beyond the 10,000 year mark. Then the containers started to fail because the containers are made out of steel alloys. And in fact, the state of Nevada, which is adamantly opposed to being the nation's radioactive garbage dump, showed that containers could fail within centuries because there's so much water flow through Yucca Mountain. Ironically, it's an arid area, but when it rains out there, the water does make it into the ground and some of it does percolate down, and you have a saturated situation at Yucca Mountain, which was going to be highly corrosive. One of the fatal flaws at Yucca was that it was actually a oxidizing environment. The only proposal in the world for a radioactive waste dump for irradiated fuel that was in an oxidizing environment. So given the chemical um, makeup of Yucca Mountain's geology, given the presence of a lot of water, humidity, it was gonna be a, a highly corrosive environment. And luckily for Nevada, for the Western Shoshone Indians, whose land that is, the Obama administration has canceled that proposal. But in Finland, uh, as well as in Sweden actually, there are proposals that at the present time, appear to be going forward despite objections by environmentalists, uh, anti-nuclear activists. And in both of those Scandinavian countries, instead of steel alloys, the burial containers are proposed to be copper. 
So how long that will last is a question. It's fair to say that the geological studies on these sites are not yet done. And that is very true of this Canadian proposal. The geological studies are in their infancy in Canada, and yet the Canadian government looks poised to grant approval to begin construction of this low and intermediate level dump right on the shoreline of Lake Huron in late 2013. It could be that, uh, that soon. So we really need to wake up the state of Michigan in a great big hurry. We need to get large numbers of people here writing to the Canadian government and we can provide that uh, email address, we can provide that snail mail address, the telephone number. We need to ring the phones off the hook in Ottawa, Ontario. But we need to do the same thing here in Michigan. We need to wake up not only our state elected officials, but also our federal congressional delegation, for example. They need to put a stop to this. And we can. There are so many success stories. Uh, stopping Yucca Mountain is a miracle because we were up against uh, the power of the nuclear industry in this country. Very politically powerful, very economically powerful, and yet uh, working together across the country, including along the transportation routes in 45 states, waking people up to the fact that high-level radioactive waste shipments could roll past their home on the highways, on the rail lines, even on barges, on waterways, we were able to create enough resistance in this country to stop Yucca Mountain, this very bad idea. And we need to do the same for Canada. I mentioned barge shipments, and in fact, the Yucca Mountain proposal had barge shipments on Lake Michigan, uh, 453 barge shipments of high-level radioactive waste going from Palisades Nuclear Plant in southwest Michigan up to the port of Muskegon, going from Wisconsin's nuclear power plants down to the port of Milwaukee. If a single one of those barges were to sink and release its contents into the lake, it would be an unprecedented radiological disaster for the Great Lakes. Now on the Canada side, they're proposing uh, burying all of these wastes on the shoreline, but that also means uh, importing it from across Canada. So especially with the high-level shipments, if one of those were, uh, if those were to be barged, if that was to sink, it would be a disaster for the Great Lakes. Well, um, there's indications, there's evidence that that could be on the drawing boards. The, uh, the most recent battle, and so far we've won for the past two years, was a proposal to barge from Bruce Nuclear on the Great Lakes across the ocean to Sweden radioactive waste, which is called steam generators, that are radioactive at their heart. They're even radioactive on their surface. And uh, two years ago, um, thanks to the research by Kay Cumbo with Citizens for Alternatives to Chemical Contamination, she outed the fact that this proposal was <laughs> on the brink of approval and nobody even knew about it. An initial shipment of 16 radioactive steam generators and then to be followed uh, a grand total of 64 altogether by boat on the Great Lakes, uh, no emergency plan if they were to sink, incredibly. And we built a coalition that stretched from Michigan to Scandinavia and everywhere in between, uh, especially strong in Quebec on the St. Lawrence Seaway. And we have so far for two years put a, sh a stop to this proposal, which was simply going to require the rubber stamp of a single Canadian bureaucrat at the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And it was poised to happen. We woke up uh, the Great Lakes states, all eight of them. We had uh, seven U.S. senators fire off letters to the Canadian government, to the U.S. government, which has to uh, agree with this proposal. A part of the Department of Transportation. They had to sign off on this thing. And those uh, seven senators, which included both Senators Levin and Stabenow in Michigan, asked some very tough questions that the proponents did not have answers for. So we have stopped that for now. And one speculation we have is that that shipment would have set a precedent that could then be followed by high-level radioactive waste shipments. They may have been testing the water, so to speak, to see what resistance was out there. They met a groundswell of resistance, and we need to repeat that. Again, the U.S. Department of Energy had proposed high-level radioactive waste barge shipments on the Great Lakes, so certainly the Canadian government may be considering it. They may also choose to use trucks. They may also use to, they may choose to use uh, trains or some combination. 
So we have to be vigilant about all three possibilities. Well, um, so far, so good. Uh, we had a great film showing in Port Huron, uh, which is right on the St. Clair River and was a, a base of resistance against that radioactive steam generator shipment. In fact, the mayor of Sarnia, Ontario, right across the river, uh, was one of the first to raise the alarm about this and got media attention to it, broke the story uh, at the political level, at the media level, after Kay Cumbo had outed it. Um, so that was a strong place to hold this presentation because they're uh, immediately uh, at most a few hundred miles downstream from the Bruce nuclear complex if there were to be a radiological disaster at Bruce with this proposed deep geologic repository they would receive it downstream right there in Port Huron and we're still to go up north uh, to places like Sheboygan and Traverse City hopefully Alpena uh, we have a showing scheduled for Bay City area and when you're in East Michigan on Lake Huron, you are looking across the lake uh, at the Bruce nuclear complex, which is a total of nine reactors. And truth be told, uh, they've kept this very quiet, and Michigan has slept blissfully in ignorance as the Ontario provincial government and the nuclear industry there has transported through various means, I believe there have been lake-borne transports as well, of the low and intermediate level rate. Um, what kind of reaction have you been getting on your current tour? Operating in the United States, another 25 shut down. So that's a big number, but 20 reactors alone in Ontario have been for years and even decades shipping their radioactive wastes, at least the low and intermediate level radioactive wastes, to Bruce, consolidating it there one of the more egregious and frightening activities to take place at Bruce is radioactive waste incineration, actually. And we have some evidence that they actually wait for the winds to be blowing towards Michigan over Lake Huron. And that, again, is fairly standard industry practice where they will argue that, well, there's open lake, there's a lot of open space for the radioactivity to disperse and dilute, and so that's why we do it that way. But unfortunately, Michigan would be downwind of that activity. And not to beat up the Canadians exclusively, uh, unfortunately, there's radioactive waste incineration in the United States. It's concentrated in the state of Tennessee. So the nuclear industry often looks for the path of least resistance, looks for places where it can get, get away with these uh, scandalous activities. And they've been getting away with it at Bruce for a very long time. And so not only does Michigan need to wake up about the deep underground dump that's proposed, but we need to wake up about the radioactive waste incineration. We need to wake up about the radioactive waste uh, centralization and consolidation at Bruce. It's being stored right now at what they call the Western Waste Management Facility. And the Western part, at least in Ontario, means its Western border with the United States. So look at where Ontario is shipping its radioactive waste as far from Toronto as they can get. <laughs> as close to Michigan as they can get. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. Um, we're kind of regarding this tour as a kind of a Paul Revere ride. Instead of the British, it's the radioactive waste dumps are coming and we need to stop them. Ironically, there is a British element to this story. Uh, for a number of years in the late 1990s and early uh, 2000s, a company called British Energy was leasing the Bruce Nuclear Complex and running it. The ultimate owner of Bruce is Ontario Power Generation, which is a privatized provincial utility company. It used to be provincially owned, and it was privatized, and it decided to lease to British Energy. Well, British Energy had a financial meltdown. They went bankrupt uh, about a decade ago, and in the aftermath of that, what rose from the ashes was a new Bruce Power utility, it's called, including some of the executives left over from British Energy, one of whom is the current CEO of Bruce Power. His name is Duncan Hawthorne. He's a Scottish national. And he was the one who proposed and uh, really wanted to do this uh, radioactive steam generator shipment. So uh, he's one of our adversaries, one of our opponents uh, on these many different uh, threats of 
routine radioactive releases into our environment and also the potential for catastrophic radioactivity releases. Maybe the easiest answer I could give is to, for folks to go to our website, which is beyondnuclear.org, and there you can choose from various subject matter, but on the Canadian issues, we have an international section, and under that, Canada, and we'll have all the information up there for how you can contact elected officials on both sides of the border to express opposition to the radioactive waste dumps proposed in Canada. And also on our website, under our nuclear power section under our nuclear reactors section. We have a lot of information about nuclear issues in Michigan. So the Fermi 3 new reactor proposal in Monroe, uh, the Fermi 2 old reactor in Monroe, uh, Palisades uh, in southwest Michigan, Cook units 1 and 2 in southwest Michigan. You can find information about all of these up there as well as the local groups who are involved. Uh, the movement in Michigan is growing, actually, by leaps and bounds. The opposition to Fermi 3 is growing uh, significantly, and so folks should feel free to contact Beyond Nuclear, uh, con and we can put you in touch with these local groups.